and it's like, this is not a good thing. So really all we're trying to do is become aware of it. I, I was telling somebody this morning, I feel like our subject matter today is Bible illiteracy, but I feel like I'm preaching to the, you know, to the crowd here because of the fact that um, you guys are here because you do believe in the Word of God. But sometimes even, at least what I found in the statistics, and I'll give you some of those here in a little bit, um, it is those that are the most Bible believing that are the that spend the least amount of time in the Bible. Isn't that funny? I read a, um, a, 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 a even this morning I read an article and it was called um, oh, what did they call it? I wrote it down somewhere. Um, Americans are fond of the Bible but don't actually read it. That's what the, the article was called. Um, and so um, I, I thought, well, this is interesting because this. Is true, and then so I have some statistics on that. But we're going to start out with, um, as Brandy's going to hand out some of the papers here that they got copied for us. I want to start out with a review because, believe it or not, there is a there is a method to this whole madness of six weeks. There is a, and you guys didn't get each week's title. Um, you don't get it till you get here. But each week's title is a flow from the previous week. It, it came from a thought process. Where we went, where we, I said, I want to, I think this is really a legitimate issue we need to start talking about. And then if we talk about this, then what comes next? And then we should talk about this and we should talk about it. And so there's a flow to this. So I don't want us to miss that flow. So she's handing out a, a page to you right now that is just simply for you guys to go back and review the first three weeks. So those of you that were here should have notes on those. If you don't, somebody next to you will. And I have uh, copies of the second week's notes, but uh, Cherie would have to bring copies of last week's notes uh, for you for next week. Um, so there are some, you will see that there are some blanks on this, and it's simply because once you look back at your notes, you should be able to pick up on some of the main ideas that we talked about and um, fill in those blanks. And that's just to show that you actually were thinking about what we talked about. And then I left some room because I want you to jot down some notes of things that you took away from it. I, we need to know that the, the subject matter that we're talking about is making sense and that it's making an impact as, as far as our thinking is concerned. Because really our problem is the way we think. We don't think well. And that's, uh, that's part of what we're trying to do here. So I'm going to set you guys free to do that here in this minute since I pray. And I want you to converse on that. And anybody that wasn't here for any of those weeks, make sure you fill them in on some of what went on before that. Uh, so how many of you here have been here all three weeks so far? Okay, so there's some at every table that have been here the whole time. So that's good. Um, so that discussion should work out just fine. So let's pray, please. Father, I am so grateful to be here. Grateful to be with these women um, who have come because they do want to know you. They want to know your word and um, they can handle the conviction that it brings because it makes us better. And they know that it is life. And uh, so I thank you for the privilege. Uh, I thank you for its power. I thank you for your redemptive purposes. Um, you have saved us, and now you are continually sanctifying us so that we might one day dwell in your presence forever. And that is such an amazing process, such an amazing privilege. I, I don't want us to take that for granted. So I thank you for this time. Uh, I pray that our discussions together and our time together will be productive in causing us to be people whose hearts hunger and thirst for your word and for you, because your word is who you are. So I, I pray that you will do those processes today as only the Holy Spirit can do, and we submit to you in that. In Jesus' name, amen. So on the front page there, you will see, uh, there's, there's a back to it, but on the front, it will just say review of weeks one through three. So that's just the first part of, uh, actually it's that whole first page, uh, together in your groups.
you're just helping us. So it's like to watch. She's going to come like that. So that I have So she was like, she felt like she shouldn't even go because she didn't want to judge her. Well, that's not true. So you're judging her. What are you just saying? I love you. I love you. So she's already said this is that I agree with that. And so that's the point where you say that's what we you said you agree with that. So how I think you're good at questions. Separation. Okay, that's what you said earlier. Sorry. So uh, that doesn't mean we're not safe, but then we have to deal with that separation. Yeah. And that's like, I think that people should be the
Um, and then the last one was that we seek him, and that was the Hebrews uh, verses. It said, if you believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Um, we went over that verse. And that word, seek him, means to investigate, to crave, to demand, and to search out. So this is not just a, yeah, I'd like to see him once in a while and hang out. That's not that. That is like, I can't be away from him ever. And again, we'll, we'll discuss that even more so today. So I think that our problem is, uh, this, and this relates to what we're going to be doing this week with the Bible illiteracy, because um, reading the Bible and understanding what the Bible says is two different things. Totally two different things. And um, unless we take a closer look at what these, this verse particularly, we're going to do that again, says, we will miss the whole point. And I don't know how many times all of us here probably read it numerous times, but there is so much more in this verse than what we see at the surface. So the seek him part of it means we search him out, and he is his word. So um, that's, that's where we see that. But anyway, moving on, that was the first week. And then, so we have to come to grips with, do we really believe what we say we believe? Um, and, and what does that mean to us? What does it mean to actually believe? And there was a response, as we said, to abide and seek him. And then this, the second week, Brandy and, and Bethany discussed the idea that what our problem with some of the things that we believe is that we start saying things without thinking about what we're saying. And their major point was we use this Christianese, and she, they spent the whole time, it was so fascinating, to see how their relationship started out with Bethany saying to Brandy, well, because her daughter had cancer, God is good, so Lane will be fine, that kind of thing. And Brandy responding, well, God is good even if Lane isn't fine, basically was the, was the thing. Bethany being offended by that at first, Brandy saying it, although not really expecting the outcome that actually came from it, uh, because I think even Brandy and I have talked that when she said that, she still expected Lane to be fine. But was Lane fine? Lane was not fine. And that's our problem. It can, it can crumble our faith when we say things and believe things that are not true. When we use Christianese and we do not play the thought out, uh, because we use the phrase, God is good, all the time, but we never think about, about the strings that we attach to that. We think, as, and as Bethy made very clear, that it means God is good when he does this. And, and it's that we have to get rid of the when he does this. God is good no matter what he does. That's, and, but we tell ourselves lies even in the church. And that was just one of the Christianese. They gave several examples of that, but that's a huge one. We use a lot of those Christianese phrase, phrases that really make our faith trite and unreal and unbelievable. And, and to where we don't even believe it. And so it's like we, we need to be careful of that. I think that if we say we believe what we do believe, it's so much, so serious that what we say we believe be true and be right and be complete that we better be careful about how we speak about it and not, not take it rightly. So um, they, so how has our own misguided expected outcomes, how do they fracture our faith? And they do, because um, Bethany is an absolute miracle, but I have seen people, and so is Kathy, um, I've seen people who've gone through those kinds of crises and they completely fall away from the Lord. That's usually the outcome, because, because they've expected God to do something and he didn't do it. And I've seen that happen with people even in much lesser situations than the dramatic ones that they have lived through where lesser situations happen to them, and they're like, well, God didn't come through, so he must not exist, or I'm out. I'm not, I'm not going to do this anymore. So what we believe about God and what we say we believe about, about God, we need to take very seriously um, and be careful of those expected outcomes that we put on him. So then we went to week three, and that was now how does the culture, this was the, bit, the, the church culture, how that fractures our faith by the things we say right within the church and the things that we respond how we respond to, to the Lord in the church. But how about how the culture now inundating us with their, uh, their lies and their compromises and their standards that we, and I'm not blaming the world, I'm blaming us. Because the world should think that way, that's how they think. We're the ones that are responsible to think differently. So when they influence our thinking to the negative, that is on us, it is not on them. And we need to take responsibility for that. We can't just keep saying, and when I say that, I want you to know that. We can't just say, oh, the culture, the culture, the culture. Yes, it is the culture, but it is our love of the culture that is the problem. So, 
Um, compromise in the culture means a slight and subtle deviation from biblical truth. And that usually means that the way of the world, the way of the culture is much more acceptable, I won't be rejected, and it is much more comfortable. And those are the two things that we go for. That's what we want, and that is on us. But it all goes back to then, what did I say I believe from the very beginning? What did I say I believe? Because if I really do believe it, would the culture be that tempting to me? Would that culture be that much of a, of a, a fracture, have that much of a fracturing result on my faith? So as you can see the flow of what we're doing, we're trying to figure out why is this happening and why are we falling for it is really the, the bigger deal. Well, today we're going to move on to biblical illiteracy. What are we thinking? <laughs> um, and that, of course, comes from if we're fracturing our faith by the things that we say or think wrong within the church, and then we accept wrong thought processes and, and lies from the world, why is that? Why are we doing that? And obviously, that would be because we, uh, we either don't know Scripture, don't care about Scripture, or are completely rejecting Scripture. That's, there, it's got to be one, because Scripture speaks pretty dramatically against the things that we're falling for here. We can find the truth in all of these issues if we are looking to Scripture to do that. And, and that's why he said to seek him. That's the whole point of that. So um, that's, who, that's where the next flow of this, that's where it's going to t today. And the, although the topic is Bible illiteracy, which makes it sound like we don't know it, which we don't, many don't. I'm not, you know, most of the crowd, that's why I said I'm speaking to the, to the uh, choir here, because you guys do understand, you wouldn't be here if you didn't understand the purpose of scripture. But um, again, we want, to, we want to stress that reality because it seems like, uh, we, we, don't, we aren't really getting the significance of it, or we're getting it in the wrong way. So I wanted to, um, at, at this point, I want to ask you, uh, uh, I want to ask you a question. There she is. Hey, that, this is a new baby that I haven't even got to touch yet, and I'm laughing. And there she is. I don't want to go see her so bad. Okay, okay. Two weeks old. So sweet. Oh, my. Grandma got her first. Uh, okay, it, what I want to do with you guys is uh, I looked up and did quite a bit of research on all the different reasons why you can find on Google, of course, um, as to why Christians don't read their Bibles. Why, why Christians do not interact with their Bibles. And let me tell you, it, there's a whole lot of them because it's a chronic problem right now. Uh, and the church knows it. So what I wanted to throw to you, I, I put down 10, 11, 12, 13 different ways. But I wanted to ask you, if, if somebody was to ask you that question, you don't have this tape, okay, either way. So um, this is a pop quiz. I, I kind of come up with it or something. Um, I'm going to ask you, if somebody was to sit, come up to you and do a survey and say, why do you or why do you think the church does not read their Bible? Like I said, why do we think it's so great, but yet we don't read it? Why, what are the reasons for that? What are the reasons why we do not engage with Scripture? Uh, within the, and I'm talking in the church, but it, you know, some of the statistics were actually just Americans in general, but they were also within the church. So as you're thinking, I want everybody to give me some feedback on why do you think we do not engage? Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay, see, um, she said distracted by social media. And it, number two was, I forget or I get distracted. So she's got the number two on the list is I get distracted. But their comments were on that were, if you can do social media, you can do, you can do scripture. Can I have the Bible out on my phone? Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to read that first. Okay. What, you know what that tells me? Okay, guys, we're going to be just as harsh, honest as we can be here. Because this is the reality of it. We've got to face these truths. Why is social media more enticing? than the God of the universe. Yes? Because the dopamine in your brain goes, Woo! Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 What's going on? I love yeah. it. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's Our very true. Are rewired. They're right? Rewired. Yes. 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 And, and like isn't there, I mean, I think there's a verse that says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Because of that very thing. That is really, it's like right in your face, isn't it? It's like, the world is like, like I said, so colorful, it's like fast moving, it's, it's entertaining, it's got all those things that, that um, we think we want. So again, this is what I'm saying, the culture is not the problem, we are our own problem. We are just as infatuated by what the culture gives as what the culture is. 
And the problem with that is that means that God takes a lower place. And clearly, is it logical to think that we say and you know, we believe that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, absolute love, absolute power, absolute truth, he is less exciting than the drama that goes on this planet. Well, I don't know what we're thinking. But it doesn't even make sense, does it? It really doesn't even make sense. I find it true when I can see it when my grandkids go, oh, we'd rather go skating than spend time with grandma. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> I get that because grandma and skating is two different things and they're kids. Yeah. But I don't get why I would rather spend time in a world of chaos than I would with the God who, who loves me, who created me, who has every plan for me, and who I'm going to spend eternity with. It, it doesn't make sense. Yes? Do you think that pride plays into that? Oh, probably. Absolutely. I, I feel like even in this topic of biblical literacy is that we as Christians, we think we're literate. Yes. And it's pride. Yes. And we know that God resisted the proud. Exactly. So we just suck right into yep. what the culture has for us because we think we got it. Yep. Yep, you're right. Uh, we settled for what we have. We're, we're good. We're good here. Um, I wanted to give you a, a couple of statistics, statistics as we do this. Um, one of them was 53% of Americans have read very little of the Bible. They admitted to that. 53% have read very little of the Bible. 22% read a little each day. 22% of all people, ever. So that's not, that's not good. <laughs> our, our statistics are not good. But um, I think you are right. Uh, I have, let me see what was one of them that I saw. Oh, number one reason, I'm not smart enough, yeah. is what they said. Yeah. Or I would, I would go with you and flip that and say, I don't, I, I'm too smart. I don't need it. I, I can do it on. I can do it myself. I know enough of it to be able to, you know. I mean, I know the Ten Commandments or whatever it is. I don't do those kinds of things. Okay. Any other reasons that you think people? There's there's a whole bunch of them here. So so far we've got too distracted and I'm not smart enough. Yes. A lot of people also say that they get it from the past. Oh. oh. Absolutely. That's exactly what uh, one of these. Where was the one? Um. <laughs> It said that we don't we don't need it because I get it from the people that are the professionals yeah. and they give it to me. That was that was another one of the reasons. So I get it from professionals. That's where I get it. That's like yeah. the only eating with you want to eat. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you don't ever eat at home. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, that was one of the big reasons. I go to church, those people know what they're talking about, they give me what I need. Okay, another one, yes. Oh, very good. Okay, I see you guys got this. You see what they're saying. It says one of them is I might have to change. So ignorance is bliss. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, and that that's in that same line. It's too hard. It's too hard because then I might have to do something with it. So that's a that's another one. Okay. Anything else, Tammy? Um, it's just a battle with our flesh and the spiritual realm. It and is the whole war around us. Absolutely. To try to distract. Right, but we give it, it's still, it's still back on us because yeah. we have the choice to do that. Yeah. That number 10 was I don't have time, which is kind of what that is. I don't have time. Too busy. I really, really hope that God never says he's too busy for me. I'm really hoping that. Uh, and, and fortunately, I know he never is, but boy, I hope I don't have to stand in front of him and say, sorry, I was too busy. That's a bummer. That's not good. Okay, another one. It's boring. That's exactly what they said. It, it, the, it's, it's just boring. It's just boring. Um, uh, part of that is the Bible is too confusing. Um, it's so boring and confusing. And I had written on here, um, yeah, outdated. Yes. And there was actually one that said, I have so many papers in there. I can't find which one. Alan, my lecturer, said that the Bible was contradictory. Yes, that was another one on here, that the Bible contradicts itself. And the guy on here says, um, Okay, if you can find five of those, then I'll talk to you. Yeah. But there aren't. There aren't even five of them. And there's been changed over the years. Oh, yes. That's another one. Yeah. Right? That's another one. Uh, that would be why other people don't read it. If I was to take a poll in here, what would that look like? Really, it would be the same. 
It would be the I same. Mean, if we're going to be honest, it would be the Probably same. Probably be the same. I have any of you ever done any of those things? Yes. Yeah, I thought every one of them. Every one of them, one of them so far. <laughs> but we think those things. Um, one on here that I thought was interesting that I've heard before is reading makes me sleepy. <laughs> so that means I'm going through the whole day doing other stuff and I wait till it's time to go to bed and then I try to get in a few lines. No, no. no wonder it makes you sleepy. <laughs> Number nine is I don't know where to start. Oh, Genesis means yeah. beginning. So. Yeah. I, I mean, in this day and age, especially with, with all the app, there's Bible reading programs, there's daily Bibles, there's air, audio Bible. Yeah, there really is none of those. Uh, another one is I never get anything out of it. Okay, that's problematic. That's problem. That is a problem. And this, I think, goes back to then, I would wonder what you said you believe. That's why we always go back to what we believe, what we said we believe. We have said that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, the, the, the one who, who actually created our soul, is, is boring, is, doesn't have anything to say to me. I don't want to spend time with him. Do you see the irrationality of our thinking here? This is a problem, and we all, and if, if right here we say we do it, can you imagine the church as a whole? This is, this is the problem. Bible illiteracy has gone way down, and I am not in any way against book studies, other book studies, I want you to get that, even though we, we focus on scripture, but I'm not against that. It's just that we've come to the place where it's like, okay, I'm depressed, so give me a book that's about depression to handle my issue that's got a couple Bible verses in it. Or I need some help with my kids, so give me a book on raising children that I can just focus on that, but don't give me the Bible. That's where we're at. That's, that's where we're at because it's, we, it's just too much. I, I'm going to tell this group here and hope that it doesn't have a negative outcome. But we are going to be gen studying Genesis in the fall. Genesis is a two-year study. We are, we are actually literally trying to figure out how do we break this down into pieces so people don't go two years and kid not get to a two year study. Just don't sell the name. Yeah, I, yeah so we, it's like, how do we break this down so it looks like it's a six week study, but there's just a whole lot of them. Yeah. You know, because people can't, uh, the thought of actually studying the Bible for two years is like, are you out of your mind? When um, you put it in the thing, just put the fees. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's Yes, yeah. but see, but that's what I mean, and we will have to do that, but I'm telling you, so you guys all better be there. So, um, I'm telling you because that's what we've come to. We have to package it in a way that is t a, a more easier to handle because we don't, we don't do Bible. We just don't do Bible. And, and it's like, this is a problem. This is the cause of the first three weeks. We don't know what we believe and why we believe it. Number two, we say things that are dumb about God within the church that really don't even work as far as the truth is concerned. And number three, we fall for the culture and their lies because we've got nothing to counter it. So you can see why our next, this week was Bible leaders. What are we thinking? What are we thinking? Or are we thinking? And I, I, I think we're going to uh, approach that one right now. You remember... Um, Randy, I don't know if you found it or not, but the very first week, oh. you can't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> I, I gave you a Venn diagram. And we talked about when we believe, which was the first thing, when we believe that, uh, she's going to put it up for you, and some of you probably have it, um, there is a transaction that takes place when we go from um, the, the kingdom of the world to the kingdom uh, of God. We can see that there's two different uh, worlds that are now meshing here. And um, I wanted to focus on, it's really hard when that baby's like, right there. Um, uh, distraction. It, yes, it is a distraction. Um, so, and I, I talked about the fact that we have now made an exchange. We are now kingdom people living in a world here. But, but now our whole goal for why we live is different. The reason that we're alive is way different than it was when we just had the worldly characteristics. We now have joined... A, an eternal kingdom with an eternal king with eternal truth that is now the driving force of our life. If we really believed, do, do, I'm, I'm back to that point again. If we go back to what we say we believe, if we say we believe Jesus, just like he was asking them to believe, I want to do that in just a second. This is what he's asking them to believe that this world, this kingdom of heaven, my realities of truth.
truth, who God is, those are more real than what you see right here. In fact, this world is a secondary effect to that kingdom world. This is just a secondary effect. It's secondary to the kingdom of God. And he's saying, you are now citizens of that and aliens here. So something is going to have to change. And that something is going to change by the way you respond to what you said you believed. So let's go then um, back to the, your notes today. And I want to go over some of these specific verses. John is really good. And some of this will sound redundant, but I don't think it's something that shouldn't be said more than once. Um, I think it's, it's very important that way. So we're going to go to the first section there of Bible verses, as soon as I find my page, on uh, John 8. So that where it says, Bible, are we for Bible literacy? What are we thinking? How is our faith fractured due to not reading and or understanding God's word? So even if we get to the place where we will read his word, my fear, and this is the thing that I, this is why I hate saying this, is, is that, we, that we will say it, we will read it because we're supposed to. I, I, can't, I can't even express how frustrating that is to me. <laughs> uh, when we say, I read this because I'm supposed to, because I, that's what it means to be a good Christian, and I need to check that box off to say I've done, God, I read your word today, like I'm doing him a favor. Like I'm, I'm really, he's really pleased with me now because I obeyed him. And he is pleased when you obey him. But we obviously do not understand the nature of his word. His word is not for his benefit. His word is fully, completely, absolutely for our benefit. And when we begin to see that, we will then start hungering and thirsting after it like we do for food or for Facebook in this world. Because when we realize the significance of it, it will no longer be something that we do because we have to check it. It will be because it is our life. And, and that's really what it is. Okay, so work with me here then. John 30, and what I want is I think all of us should memorize this verse. So this is the same verse that I have before, but I want us to fill it in. And this is in a New American Standard, so um, we'll, we'll go as we do. But we're going to say this sometimes because by the time we're done here, I want us to know these verses. And I want us to know that it's John 8, 31 30 through 32. So Jesus, therefore, was saying, to remember that he's speaking to the Pharisees, and they're rebuking him and telling him, no, we aren't going to believe you, even though you've done all these crazy miracles that we don't know what to do with, but we're not going to believe you because we don't want to. But it says, that the statement there was that there were some who believed in him. So Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who believed him, there's that word believe again, if you, notice the if, bless you, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. I'm going to say that again, and we should have this going over our head continuously. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Now, remember, we're going to talk about in a minute who Jesus is speaking to when he says this and what this means to them, because we need to figure out what it means to us. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall... Set you free. You guys know that. You, you know, you should know by now. I'm going to say it again because we can't hear this too much. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It means, the word truly means actually, means really disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right, so let's talk about these verses a little bit. Let's consider it. Now, there's, I have a two, two, two goals here. Number one is for us to see what Jesus said about the significance of his word. Number two is for us to get into it and to see that you don't just read it. Okay, we can just read that verse, right? But let's do what we said. Let's seek him in that verse. That's what we're going to do today. This is what, And when we're going to end, I'm going to give you like what we would do normally in a pursue study where you're actually going to take a chapter of John and you're going to study it at your table with questions that I've asked. Because I want you to, this is what... This is what it takes. We don't just read God's word. We want to know what he said and why he said it. And so therefore we, we study his word. All right, so let's look closer at this. Consider what Jesus is asking those listening uh, to do if they believed in him. I mentioned this the first week. You're a Jew, right? You've been following the law your whole life. 
That's what you do. That's what everybody in your culture does. That's what everybody in your um, your village does. That's what's expected of you. That's what your parents do. That's what your great grandparents did. That's what you're passing on to your children. Is you follow the law. You follow you follow Torah and you follow all of the uh, the um, traditional teachings of the elders because they were the ones who explained what the law meant. So when they say keep the Sabbath and they give you you know however many it was laws that went with that. Yeah, you follow all those laws. That's what it means. And this is what it means to be a human being to them. This is who they are. They're, they're Jews who do this. So, when he says to them, you need to now believe me. What is that going to, what is that going to say to them? Because what had Jesus done already that would have caused them concern about believing him? Okay, everything, right, he broke almost all of their religious leaders' laws, all of the traditional laws that have been passed down about those, about the Ten Commandments and about the law. He broke them all the time. So I'm a Jew, I'm watching Jesus, and I'm thinking, wow, this guy healed, and my goodness, he's got all these things. But see, if I believe in him, I'm believing in someone who breaks everything that I've lived with my whole life. Right? That takes a, you better stop and think that through kind of moment. Right? I, I don't think that this is just a, oh yeah, I like him. I think I'll just follow him. This is like a, not a groupie event. This is a whole different kind of event. So let's consider that. You would no longer look to the law and the religious leaders as the authority. So when I'm looking at Jesus, I'm going to believe in Jesus now. That means all that the law, all the thousands of years that we've had the law and the Jewish religious leaders and their authority over that law, all that God has told us to do is no longer the authority, but I look to Jesus' words as their authority of, and source of truth. So they're standing there looking at him going, okay, Jesus or the law? Because what Jesus is saying, they think, it's not, but they think is contradictory to everything they've ever else they've believed. This is what it's going to mean for them to believe him. This, this is what I want us to take seriously, what it means to believe. So they've got to consider that. Second, no longer will they depend on the sacrificial system to remove their sins. Oh my goodness. How in the world do you now not sacrifice for your sins and go on thinking, wow, I've got all these sins now that I didn't sacrifice for, when that's been your whole life? That, that's not an easy thing and not an easy decision to make. This is what, and again, I'm saying this because we're taking two verses of scripture and we're Die, we're, we're just breaking it apart and, and thinking about the reality of what's going on there. We're not just reading it. We're, taught, we're trying to put ourselves in that position to see why Jesus said what he did and what he meant when he said it, when he said you have to believe in me. Uh, because that, these are the hearers that were there. So they no longer believe in the sacrificial system. Never uh, The sea, they have to risk their relationships, their reputations, and their community standing for that truth. Because as soon as I say, I believe you, Jesus, you, you probably lost your job, you lost your family, you lost your community. Nobody's even going to interact with you anymore. You're a heretic. In fact, you might even be stoned. Because he was, I mean, he was killed, right? So if you're going to believe him. Um, and we know this example is true because of the, of the man that was, and I, I mentioned this before, the man that was born blind and Jesus healed him and he went into the synagogue and they're like, okay, who did, who did this? Why did he do it? And he's like, well, I, I don't know who it was. I just know that I was blind and now I see. And they're like, are you crazy? I mean, it's the Sabbath. He should be doing. He should be carrying your 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 thing. That you know, he, well, the guy told me to pick up my thing, and I mean, he healed me, so I picked up my thing and walked. Yeah. Um, and they're like, "No, you can't do that. That's 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 terrible. Why would you do that?" And he's like, "Well," and they're like, "He's a sinner," and, and he's like, "What? I've never heard of a sinner take, causing a blind man to see. What? Explain this to me. How does that happen? How does a sinner heal my?" And they're like, well, who are you? Smarter than we are? We're the smart guys here. You need to listen to what we say. This is Linda's version, by the way. <laughs> um, and he's like, funny. I've never seen a sinner heal a blind man before. And you know what? I don't know about the guy. All I know is that I was blind, and now I see. So they, they're like, okay, you're out. He, remember he even called his, par they called his parents in? Yes. And they're like, all we know is that that is our kid and he was blind, but you need to ask him. Because they know that if they stick up for him, they're out. And once you're out of the synagogue, you lose everything. The risk was so high. But by the time that conversation was over, they're like, you are out. They kicked him out. Go back and look at the passage. Because they did. And that was a very hard 
reality for anybody, anybody to take that risk. That's why his parents were like, gee, we don't know. Yes, he's our son, and he was born blind, but you'll have to talk to him. Because we don't want to take responsibility to say <coughs> that, yes, it was. Jesus. we do believe that Jesus did heal him. So it was a risky situation when that happened. So you're risking your relationships, your rep reputation, and all of it for this. This is what Jesus is saying. If you believe me, you have to believe me. You have to believe what I say. These are the things that they had to take into consideration when they said, I believe you. Have we taken those things into consideration? Have we taken things that how serious it is to believe him and how radically our life will change? He's assuming there will be a radical change in your life. He's assuming there will be a cost. There, there was a cost. There was a high cost for them. But see, we read those passages and we don't even think that through. And we wonder why we don't know what it means to believe. We just think it means, yeah, I, I can't come up with any other explanation, so there must be a God, right? And if he's going to give me heaven, great, I'll believe in him. That's how we take it. But these things actually, we do the same thing. We have to make the same sacrifice. It, it just looks different for us because we're not Jews. That's absolutely right. But we no longer look to the leaders as authority, but God's word is authority. Exactly. We no longer have to do to earn it. It's not our doing anymore. And now we might risk relationships. That's right. I know I have. I've lost some relationships because of my belief in Christ. So you're absolutely right. Thank you for bringing that out. We, we have to have the same understanding of the cost of what it means to do that. Because we have now joined a different kingdom. So if we have to say no to Facebook, then we say no to Facebook. I'm not telling you to say no to Facebook. I'm just saying if you do have to do that. If you have to, as was already stated at this table, I won't name names because I'm always picking on her. If you have to give up, <laughs> if you have to give up watching certain videos. So she said she went home and took them all off her, her computer after the first week. There, we, we need to start understanding. Believing is not just going, yeah, I believe it. I'm going to get some really great things out of this. And I have all these expectations of what God should do for me. That's not what it means to believe. And this is eternally serious. Exactly. This is eternally serious. So um, that's, that's the reality of that. Number two, what would be the result of abiding in his word in verse 32? When we start, and abiding, remember, it means to stay there. It means to remain. And you're going to study that today on the reality of what that means. Don't miss this. We use this word abiding all the time, and we think we know what it means, and we do not know what it means. We do not pay attention to what it means. And, and it's what, what the reality was, what Jesus was saying to them, is if, if you believe me and you abide in my, in my word, that meant not just hang out with me once in a while. That's not what that meant. And you're going to see that in the study that we're going to do here in a minute. It doesn't mean that. You cannot change kingdoms, completely switch the, the um, uh, demographics of that kingdom and the requirements of that kingdom and the culture of that kingdom and then just hang out with the king once in a while. And then go back and spend most of your time in the other kingdom. That's not the way, this, that's not the way it works. And Jesus knew it. Jesus knew... That's what he's telling them. Unless you take seriously what it means to believe me, and then come and stay with me, stay with me, you won't, you won't, stay, you won't be able to do it. There is no way that if they, if he told them this, and they said, yes, I believe in you, and then went back off into their regular life without going back to him and seeing him and listening to him and paying attention to what he said, what would happen? They would have, they would have gone right back into the Jewish religious system. It happened all the time, which is what Paul was talking about. That, remember, many of them wanted to, okay, we'll believe in Jesus, but we've got to be circumcised. We've got to keep the law. We gotta, that's the outcome they came to. That, and he's saying, unless, this is how hard it's going to be. This is such a contrary belief system now to everything around you, unless you stay with me in it. And you will see from John 17 what he meant by stay with me in it. We're going to do that in a minute. Um, that you, you'll not make, you won't make it. If you go back out there and just go back to your regular life and don't just really engage with me now, you will go back to your old way of living. It will happen every time. It's kind of like the parable of the soils. The soils, remember, they came up for a minute, and then the cares of this world just drowned them out. Satan came and plucked them away, whatever it was. It's the same thing. To abide with Jesus means something much more serious than to meet with him once in a while, or to think about him now and then, or to sing songs to him, uh, or to listen to somebody else talk about him. That's not what it means to, to abide with Jesus. And we better come to person. And that's what I mean. This is just two verses that we're talking about here. This is the difference between studying God's word, taking it in and letting him speak to you, and reading it. Two different things. All right, so um, 
So what was the result of abiding in his word in verse 32? You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And you know what the truth is? Jesus said you will know the truth. Didn't the Jews, didn't every Jew there think they had the truth? Mm -hmm. So really when Jesus is saying this, he's saying, you don't have the truth. You, you, have, to, you have to listen to me to have the truth. Wow. No wonder the Pharisees went, what the heck are you talking about? And then when he made the next statement, they really freaked out. Which if you go on in that passage, they didn't have time. But you will see that that's, they freaked out over his next phrase, phrase, which was, and the truth will do what? Set you free. And, if, and they're like, what, what are you talking about? We've never been slaves to anyone. We're Abraham's children. We're Jews. We're not slaves to anyone. And he's like, you know what his response was? Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. That's what he's talking about, be set free. He's, being, he's saying, I will set you free from sin. Which means that not only does he purify us once and for all, but daily, moment by moment, we will be set free from sin. Sin will no longer dominate our life. That's what Jesus was saying to them. He's saying, you're following the law, you're doing all the religious services, and you are bound in sin, is what he's telling them. Wow, that was a radical thing for a Jew to go, what in the world? I mean, seriously, do you not, like, all of a sudden hear... I, if it would have been me, because this is the way I am, I'd have like 16 questions just like that. <laughs> well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? I'm sure they did. And that's what he's saying. You've got to abide with me because I will answer all those questions. I will give you the truth. And the truth really is conformity to the nature of things as they really are. Conformity to the, to the nature and reality of things as they really are. That's what truth is. So what he's saying is that in your observances of the law, which of course the law is truth, but in the way that you're observing it and the way you're living, it's not what things really are. He's saying, I am what things really are. That's a, that's a whole new commitment, I think, at, at that point. Um, okay, on the back side, we're going to move to John 15. So we just did John 8, two verses in John 8 found out what, how serious Jesus was about what it meant to abide with him and to believe him. And now let's go to John 15, 4 through 6 and say, okay, then where else does he talk about this? This would be, this would be the, the key uh, to Bible study is cross-referencing. All of you, probably every single Bible in here, if you have cross-references, they will cross-reference John 8 that we just did, 31 through 2, John 15. So cross-referencing is, is really, really important when you're studying the Bible. You want to see what else does it have to say about that issue. Well, Jesus clarifies once again, a couple chapters later, what he just said about abiding and what that means. And so, let's do this John 15, 4 through 6. Again, mine's a New American Standard. But the first word is he says is, abide in me. He says it again. Abide in me, only now he adds, and I in you. Now, we know that He's getting closer to his death when, when the Spirit will come and he actually will abide in us. Right? That was his goal. And this is what he says. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So he's giving an example of what it means to abide. Now with our cross-reference, we can learn some more about what that means, about what Jesus thought that mean, meant. <laughs> he didn't just think it. He knew it. So, unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you, unless you abide in me. These are familiar verses. We all know these verses. But that's why we're taking a closer look at them. It's the difference between reading them and setting them. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. And what is the fruit? Love, joy, peace. It means you've got a new nature. It's not just actions. The fruit is not just things you do. They spring from a heart of a new nature, is what that is. I'm going to give you a whole new nature. So in other words, you used to, he's telling you, you used to abide by the law for your own good. Because if you don't, you're, you're, going, to get, you're going to be in trouble, right? Now I'm going to put something different inside of you, and your abiding with me will look different than just following a rule. It won't be following a rule anymore. It'll be your nature as to who you are. So, for apart from me, you can do nothing. So in other words, there will be no fruit. There will be none of that 
those characteristics of God and his kingdom if you don't abide with me. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Three verses that Jesus says that pack a whole lot of his intention that go back to John 8 and what he said about abiding in him. So I want us to think for a second. And this is what the thoughts that went through my mind when I read this in connection with the other one. Those who had believed in Jesus were making a radical decision that would change their lives forever. Jesus knew it would be difficult to remain in that state because of the level of rejection and persecution it would involve. All their affections and lifestyles would now have to be oriented to the new kingdom, remember the one side of the Venn diagram, that they were now committed to. The law was still God's directive, but a new understanding of it would be necessary. This would be a difficult transition after all the years of indoctrination by the religious leaders. So, Jesus is saying to them, you've got to abide in me because if you don't, everything you've already been taught, all the ways of the world, all the things, all the habits that you've already done will continue on unless you intentionally, purposely, continually dwell with me and my words. That's pretty serious, isn't it? So like I said, he wasn't saying, let's just hang out once in a while. And he knew it. He knew that this is that what he's asking them to do, what he's asking them to do as far as believing in him, is so hard. Facing what he, they were going to face in this world, that there's no way they can even stay with it unless they really, with every effort in them, remain with him. You get what I'm saying? That's the reality of what Jesus was saying to them. Uh, this, is, this is intentional on his part because he knows this directive is going to be hard. So number one, consider what Jesus knew must happen for this difficult process to take place. So in other words, for them to fight against the, all the things that they've had for so long, against their communities, about being rejected from their families, losing their jobs, whatever it is, feeling like I'm not even following the law now, so God's going to hate me. All of those things are going to come pouring in on them, and he knows that. So the word abide, which means to stay, is the way he explained what it would take for their success. In John 15, 4 through 6, he reinforced their understanding of that by the example he gave of what abiding really means. Okay, so now, if you're turned to that passage and you have it right above, we just filled it in, I want you in your groups to answer the next questions. Yeah. 
we try to do, but it's very hard. It's hard to do that and not, you know, stand up here and not feel like they're telling us nothing. Um, I'm going to give you the the rest of the remainder of time here in a minute to um, to do this all to, to do that to abide in His Word is what you're going to do, and that's that really is why we exist as pursue um, because we believe that God's Word is God. <laughs> we, we believe that what He said is is worth listening to. And, um, and he gave it to us for a reason. So we want to encourage that as much as we can. So um, what is the example he gave as an object lesson to abiding branch? Vine of the branches, right? So he said, okay, I said this before that I want you to, to abide. Now let me describe it, what that means by an object lesson. And this object lesson, and all of us have seen that. In fact, I just did that today. I came home after camping, and one of my big pots of flowers had flipped over on top of itself onto the floor. And, of course, so... Many of those branches were no longer abiding <laughs> on the plant. Did Some of them were broken, trying to help why. They were kind of like hanging on. Please. But, yeah, please, I mean, but see, if I had just taken those ones that were partially broke off and just put them up and just taped them on, they still would have died. It, because once they're disconnected from, because what is the, what is that vine giving the branches? Life. It's very life. Yeah. It's, it's giving, it's very life. This, that's what I said. You can't abide with Jesus and just hang out with him. He is our life. Any more than these sweet little babies, when they were in the womb, if you detach them from their umbilical cord, there's going to be a problem. Because that's the life source. He is our life source. Which means that his word is our life source. It's, and this is what I was saying by, we have this... I don't understand. Well, I do. It's because we don't understand what he's saying. That's why it's so important to look at what Jesus was actually saying. Because somewhere we can come around out saying, um, okay, his word, he wants me to abide in his word, but that just simply means I can take it once in a while and read it here and there, or, you know, spend a few time, five time, or whatever it is. But if I've got something more important, I could, because we think that it's not what it is. See, we haven't looked at what it is. If we knew it was the life source... If we know that if we want to be close to God, he said, this is where you do it. This is where I give my life to you. Besides the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has filled us, and now the Holy Spirit wants you to... Remember, what was the purpose of the Holy Spirit? It was to remind you of everything that I said. So, that's what he said. Remember, the New Testament wasn't written when Jesus said, abide in my word. Listen to my words. They, and he, wasn't, he was saying, it's going to be written. Everything I'm saying to you, he said, is the truth. All of my words, that's why he later had it written down in, in the New Testament form. And now we take that in because, and remember what John said at the beginning of John? In the beginning was the Word. word. And who was the Word? Jesus. Jesus was the Word. So we, we cannot maintain a relationship with Jesus. It, it not that correlates to what we say we believe. And not stay attached to that vine and have it be our life source which he has given through his spirit and through his word. So if we're just going to play with the word, we're going to wither on the vine. That's, that's all there is to it. Well, and that's what we were talking about here, is you can't disconnect the two. No. Because that's where distortions happen. And that's what we have done, is we either think we're abiding in Christ, but yep. we don't need the word, yes. which gives us religion. Yep. Or we abide in the word, which gives us knowledge, yes. but we don't have... The relationship. The relationship. Yes. So yeah. a lot of our Christian culture distortions are coming because we've separated the two. We separated the two. Yes, very true. All right, so what does the branch get from its vine? Life. It gets life. Everything. Everything that it is, and it cannot, it cannot exist outside of that. We will never be the church as we were intended to be. We will never be the light in the world that we were intended to be. We will never reflect Christ the way we were intended to be without the Word of God being a continual source of life on our part. That's just what Jesus said. This isn't Linda said it or Pursue said it. You just read it. That's why I had you read it and answer it. Because there's no way of getting around it. That's just the reality of what it is. And now, we said we believe it. And we said we believe it. That's exactly right. That's, that, and that's, he's talking to those who did believe in him. And yet now he's saying, now that you say you believed in me, this is what it's going to take. This is what it's going to take to have a relationship with me. Um, and there is no other way. So, number three, how does abiding in Christ relate to abiding in his word? It's the life source. <laughs> it's the same thing, right? That's why I said John 1, he is the word. So when the world he says, that wants to destroy us. Yes, yes. We have to stay connected. Absolutely. 
And, and he even said that. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. And nothing, you know, if they're going to hate my words, they're going to hate what you say about me as well. That's the cost. And, and as I explained earlier, the cost to a Jew, uh, I'm not going to be on the camera ever. So, um, <laughs> Everybody turn in now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll be on the camera. <laughs> when he was explaining the cost to them, they understood it. They understood what we don't understand. We just take it and go, it's just something we can add to our life. And that was never what he intended. But we, we get there because we don't study his word. You can even read this and not get there. You have to look at what was intended by what he meant. And that's why we study the word, not study about the word, uh, you know, kind of do a devotion on the word, listen to a sermon on it. We look and see what he says to us. All those things are good too, but he, he wants to speak to us. Hey, hey, where are you going with the baby? Okay, <laughs> okay. I'll let you do that. Okay, so abiding him in Christ, when he says abide in me, and I am you, he means my words in you, right? Because he's already said that in John 8. Abide in my word. It's the same thing. Same exact thing. That's the call he's given us. Okay, so uh, because of all of this now, I want to give you a chance, as I said, to abide in his word. Um, and to do some of this on your own. So you're going to take the last page, and it is read John 17. And you are going to discuss John 17 and then do some cross-referencing because that's what has... God's word validates itself. So if we're going to want to know, that's why I said, if I want to know what abiding meant in John 8, then I go to John 15 and it tells me what abiding meant. So it, it will explain that itself. So um, we want to do that first before we start looking at other, at other sources. Now I am all about the Greek and the Hebrew I mean, I, because it helps me to understand. I think sometimes, and, I'm, and I took Greek and I took Hebrew, but I'm... I'm just totally dangerous. I have no nothing. I mean, I'm just, it, it was like, I could, all I could do is say I did that. I couldn't give you the alphabet. I couldn't, couldn't, you know, I can read some of the words, that, but I couldn't tell you what they mean. So it was like, but I know where you can find that. Yeah. Because it's all, now, I, I mean, I have books, books and books and books on the Greek and their, their definitions. I even have a Bible. It's called a Zodiacus Bible, and it's got Greek definitions right in a keyword Bible. It's got the Greek definitions because I, I really do like to hear it in their language. But the fact is, if I if I don't feel like looking that up, I just get on my phone, this is where we should be using our phone for, and go, what is the Greek word for abide? And it'll pull that word right up and give me the Strong's number and tell me the definition if I don't have a Strong's and do all. There is no reason we don't we can't look at these things more closely. And um, that's really what it takes. What did Jesus really say? Um, how close can we come to knowing what he really said? And that, of course, would be with, that, with his own language. So, um, you're going to take John 17 and uh, do, this is what we would normally do in a regular Pursue session. Uh, this summer, Pursue is not anything like what we do all year long. Um, all year long, we, we have books of the Bible. We take it usually a chapter or half a chapter at a time, uh, depending on how long the chapter is. And there are questions that di relate directly to that passage. So, we're studying the passage itself. And you meet in groups for, for about an hour, a little over, and then you come in for a lecture, and that's just somebody uh, reiterating what we just read, um, kind of like Bible City Fellowship does. But the goal is to get us into it, to get us into it, and, and to learn how to ask the questions that lead us to further truth. So that's what you're going to do. So thank you. You're, you're free to go. Well, you're not. I'll probably say something. <laughs> so we're free to read John 17. Yes. Yes, they start to come out. Yes. Yeah. But are they your people to like the Israelites are the Jews are the Jews? Okay, and they say Hebrews. They call them Hebrews. And they're supposed to be Hebrews. And it was spoken to. And all of a sudden I thought, I'm not saying I got to go. I get to go. What? Yes. 
Yes. I want to. Yes. Yeah, gives you a whole different. I wanted to switch that word because of learning. Yes, that's right. That's right. I mean, it's just weird. Yeah. 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 Yeah
They have kept her word. I just I don't know if she said she said she said But I think it just said it was I mean I'm too busy. Yeah. But pretty much right out. Because they can't be word. They have kept her word. Is he talking about the Jewish people? Oh, I know it pretty well. He's paying for it. He's talking to me. No, what? He's paying for it. Like you said, I ask questions. So what are you saying? He's talking to me. I'm like, that's the situation. And you say, why do you find that he's paying for it? Why is that? I mean, I don't know why it's paying for it. I am not paying for it. I mean, like, with yeah. that, she said this is a waste of time. Yeah. Well, why did she feel it was a waste of time? I'm upset. I already questioned her. I'll tell you to say something. Yeah, I should have said, I should have said, have you seen the scriptures? What do you mean by that? You said that. You said that. You said that. You said that. You said that.
cross reference to John 8 51, which is where she goes over here, which said, Oh, so these are the, these are the, oh, I guess that's part of what we're doing right here. It's good for you to struggle for it. Yeah. 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 Working out, working out. He's a and holding his
Let us, Father, follow through with that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to us through your word so powerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.